So if you pull up, pull up in. <laughs> it takes me like 10 minutes to go like, okay, is your phone unplugged? Is your whatever? And, and then we just sort of cross our fingers that the tech glitch doesn't happen as we record, which, um, you know. Okay. Then I just put a little typo, like, oh, by the way, the tech goblins got us. But then it Hi, everyone. It's Susie Morta from Greater Than We, and I am back for another conversation with women that love what they do. And today, I am so excited because I get to talk to my new friend, Michelle Fetch. And we are here, she, you know, you're not going to even believe what it is that she does and everything that she does sort of resonates with me. So I'm going to start with, she's a serial entrepreneur and visionary. She's the founder and executive director of the largest TEDx women event on the planet, which my secret wish bucket list is to be a TEDx speaker one day. Not that, you know, I'm just sharing. Um, she's the founder of Stand, which is a full service agency, which supports businesses discovering you know, what it is that they stand for. So I love that, right? Greater than we, raising each other up. But we're really here to talk about her passion project, Women Enough. And that is um, something that resonates with me because struggling with body image issues myself, I so appreciate that her purpose is to help support women um, kind of owning their self-worth and respect and confidence and just really step into their light and their greatness. So... Welcome, Michelle. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. And you know, it's also on my bucket list to do a TED Talk, so. <laughs> oh, is it really? <laughs> I organize them, uh -huh. and I have been for the past three years, and I want to do one too, so. I, I think this For is those of us especially that are, um, you know, behind the, behind the curtain, producing things for other people, it's like there is a time where it's important for us to get into what it is that you're doing for others. You know, I was just telling you before um, we really started recording that, you know, as an event planner, I help create memories for um, other people. So this summer when I took, my family went on a vacation before my daughter left for college, I thought it was important to create a memory for our family too. So it's just like what you're saying. Yeah. I love that. So to get started, why don't you tell us a little bit, because um, we are being seen or watched, we will be watched by people really globally. And um, so this is a great way to sort of get the message out there and it affects women all over uh, the world, our global sisters. But tell us, you know, how you got to this point, what you've been doing um, work-wise that led you to here and why is it you love what you do? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And mm -hmm. I love to talk about why I love what I'm doing <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because it's my story. So I had, um, I had an eating disorder that started at the age of 12. Grew up in a grew up in a family in a house that was like many people dysfunctional and there wasn't a lot of support for me as a girl or a woman. There I wasn't really taught what it meant to be a woman other than what was shown to me. And um, by the age of 12, I was um, watching a movie, a, like a lifetime special movie with a friend of mine. And now I was, I developed faster than kids my age. I'm the baby of five kids. So not only did I physically develop faster, I emotionally developed faster. And that was really hard to be a girl amongst, you know, bully, bullying kids. And I am um, at, at the age of 12, I was sitting with my skinny blonde friend whose dad was a banker. Her mom, I think she stayed at home. Parents were a lot younger than mine, and I always thought that they had the perfect life. And then I thought, okay, well, I'm not blonde. I can't even try to be because it doesn't look good. <laughs> and I never, I never will be. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, and at the age of twelve, you know, watching this movie, it was about these two girls that had eating disorders. It was called The Secret Between Friends, mm -hmm. and these two girls were, you know, one had anorexia, one had bulimia, and then they went between, you know, binging, bulimia, anorexia. And so watching that with my little friend, I went into the bathroom and I threw up for the first time. Wow. And I remember feeling such a sense of power hmm. and relief. Like I was, 
you know, like there was a secret that was going to help me better myself. And there was a sense of, um, of like strength that I had that, that I could do that. Um, and eating disorders are very much like that, a mm -hmm. sense of control and power. Right. Um, and, you know, that was really the beginning of my 17 year journey, having a variety of eating disorders and, you know, and all of those, all of my own issues stemmed from my belief that I wasn't good enough, that I wasn't wanted, that I wasn't worthy. And in addition to being in a household where my father is very masculine, very, um, he's, you know, verbally abusive. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then also seeing magazines with women that looked nothing like me. Right. So I thought that what I was supposed to be and my worth could be summed up into six letters. Pretty. Wow. Yeah. So that's what I decided <clears throat> basically that I was going to be. I was a very like gregarious, funny, entertaining little girl. And I shut off. I, I just shut it all off. And then I was aiming to be skinny and I was aiming to be pretty and I aimed to have the perfect hair. And so, you know, I, I worked my first job. I worked at a Veda corporation. I would go in the morning and I would work out before work. I would work out at lunch. I would work out after work. I would do a thousand sit-ups. I would run 10 miles. Like I was crazy. And then not even eating. And then in the meantime, you know, being a size zero, being empty on the inside and feeling like I had to numb a part of myself, you know, then I would go out and drink and then I would go black out. Like all of these crazy Mm -hmm. things that were symptoms of a bigger issue and that's the you know the needing to learn how to really love and care for myself and heal some really old wounds right wow that you know that really hits home because I will say that um that I, I can feel it and I um also grew up not enjoying my body looking not look you know one of these things was not like the other that was me I was the tomboy I was really athletic. I wasn't blonde and I wasn't thin and I was kind of muscly. And nowadays that is maybe okay. But back then it was big. It was, con you were considered big. And so body image was, is, you know, a, was a real issue for me. And um, so I can absolutely relate and having, um, you know, the bulimia or anorexia and that sense of control in, in what seems to be out of control and I'll show you and I can do this. Um, it's, a it's a tough journey for girls and for um, women as we get older because I think that certain messages, I talk about messages a lot and, you know, you could have called me, you know, you're stupid, you're, um, you're ugly, you're whatever it is, but you call me fat. And that was the one that stuck. That was the thing that hurt the worst. And that would be, and, and, you know, I had an older brother and he would tease me and I could let stuff roll off my back. But that one, not only did it stick, I lived to make it be true. Like I, in my, um, in my years after having kids and just sort of numbing, like what's going on? I'm not working. I got really big. And it was about seven years ago that I took off a bunch of weight, but it's, there's a lot of healing and there's a lot of layers, right? That you have to pull back. So um, doing the work is really tough. I really admire what you're doing and putting it out there for others to uh, feel and see, and that it's okay. It takes, it really takes a long time. Yeah. It's like, I know that, and, and this is the problem in our society where we live in a, you know, diet fad society mm -hmm. where it's like okay you're going to do this program you're going to do this yoga you're going to do this class mm -hmm. this, trx this whatever and mm -hmm. exercise is really important mm -hmm. and there are people that also look healthy on the outside but they're not healthy on the inside so i mean one of the things that with something around like fat shaming mm -hmm. now people um are so mean to other people and around fat specifically Mm -hmm. Now I have my own feelings about it. Like I know that I would never let myself get beyond X point. Mm -hmm. but, um, 
But one of the things is that loving ourselves is something that happens on the inside and we can't heal ourselves whether we're a size zero and we're exercise fanatic and we hate ourselves or we're a size 24 and we are obese and we hate ourselves. Like it comes mm -hmm. from loving ourselves right where we're at now and deciding that no matter what we look like, no matter what we feel like, that we're going to, in a sense, like mother ourselves, like Absolutely. Love and take care of ourselves. Because mm -hmm. as like, I'm, I'm not a parent, I know you are, mm -hmm. but um, it's like we would never treat other people the way that we treat ourselves. Oh, hell yeah, absolutely. I'm with you on that. I mean, I actually, so the, the conundrum is exercise is almost like a form of meditation. I love exercising, which most people don't. And I didn't realize that. I like that feeling of that endorphin release and all of it. But um, it's, there's a delicate balance. And, and there are people that even, you know, get competitive in exercise class you know, why are you doing it this way? And I can, it, it, the whole thing is just silly because you have to do it for yourself and you have to take care of yourself. And as a mother, I um, teach my kids very often. I mean, I've, this message, hopefully it's, it's in them. They've heard it from the beginning is that when, you know, people are mean and the kids are mean to other kids for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, fat shaming or bullying or whatnot, it's because they don't feel good about themselves. Yeah. And they're just doing, they're just projecting their stuff on these kids and maybe they're catching it at home. You don't know. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure that they're catching it at home for a lot of people. Right. You know, whether they, whether it's something that they pick up really verbally from their parents, if they actually hear their parents say something or if it's some like a, you know, a subconscious behavior of their parents. It's like we mirror our parents. So whether our parents tell us that, you know, for mothers, it's like, I call it the mother daughter mirror. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, my mother could, tell me that I'm beautiful. Mm -hmm. But if what she's saying to herself is that she looks tired, ugly, fat, whatever. And I look at her and I see, well, my mom's like a 110 pounds. Right. Right. So if she's fat, if she's not pretty, if she, if I like think I look at her and I'm like, wow, my mom, like I was called big boned growing up. Oh, I'm me too. I was bigger than my mom. She was like a hundred pounds wet. You know, yeah. and that was so hard for me. Mm -hmm. I was like, Why? Okay. So I'm bigger than my mom. My dad calls me big boned and athletic. And if I you know, worked out more, I could just take off a couple pounds. And I'm like, I don't want to be big boned. Like I want that. There's a train. Oh, good. They're, they're, they're um, saying that's right. They're agreeing. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, it's like we, up until I think we really put a light on it. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't really notice how much our life impacts us. I think we do. In a lot of ways, it's really like we're so engrossed in it, but not until we step back and we actually like dissect each part, like, wow, where did this come from? Right. Well, that's doing the work, right? Yeah. Peeling back the layers of the onions. And isn't it so interesting that once you do it, um, you see other people doing it all the time. Like the, the, yeah. that people beat themselves up or they don't have kind things to say, or there's that little quick, you know, statement, which... I was a hundred percent guilty of, yeah. and I, um, you know, I only smiled when you were telling your story because I thought you were talking about me, actually, right? I'm bigger than my oh, mom. I read, I was I read your biography earlier. Big bone. I'm athletic. You're like, it's, yeah, that's me. That's it. You got it all. But um, it is what you know. And then you, once you realize that when you start, you know, you have to love yourself. I didn't even know, you know, embarrassingly. So I admit this when I give talks sometimes. When someone said you really need to practice some self love. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I had to Google it. I didn't even know what that meant. Like, I, I like myself. I'm doing, you know, I'm doing this. I, I'm taking care of that. Everything's going well. But what I realized is, you know, you might have different sides to your Rubik's Cube, and some of those sides are all lined up, but some of them aren't. And in order to make it work, you have to undo the ones that you even think are good, you know? So. And, and self love is so elusive. Mm -hmm. And I think that the whole self-love thing can, can also feel very shaming to women. Yes. It's like, there's another thing that I'm not doing good enough. <laughs> there's another thing that I don't get. Oh, well, she is exercising. She's right. dating. She's doing this. Well, mm -hmm. that doesn't feel like me. Right. What am I supposed to do? So, right. Well, or it could feel selfish, right? Like it could feel like, what do you mean? I have to, I can get a massage and not feel guilty about that or, I can mean? take time for my, 
yeah, it, it, you just go, wait, I'm supposed to do for everybody else. And certainly as a mom or as I think a woman, you are put on, you are just sort of uh, from centuries ingrained in you to please, right? To help everybody else. Yeah. So, wow, that is, um, what are some, well, let's talk about self-care or self-love. Do you have any favorite tips? What do you love to do to, you know, nurture yourself when you're feeling a little off? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I've been feeling off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, my, like there's a meditate, a specific meditation that I got turned on to while I was in Bali. Mm -hmm. And I love to listen to that. I really feel like I go into like a surrender mode and I feel so safe while I'm listening to it. It sets me at ease. Mm -hmm. um, I love to walk. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, so you said, you know, you love to exercise. Mm -hmm. I have, I still have a really, um, I'm still very resistant to normal, like working out mm -hmm. for my entire life. I used it as a way to punish myself and to make myself better. So no matter the fact that I don't have an eating disorder, I still have distorted thinking in some ways. Sure. So I go to the gym mm -hmm. and I'm like, Oh, I have to lose 10 pounds in the next five minutes. Right. And I don't, and I'm like, feel like a failure. Right. And like that pattern. So mm -hmm. um, yoga feels really good to me. Dance feels really good to me. Mm -hmm. Sex feels really good to uh -huh. me. Uh-huh. Sure. Um, Absolutely. And I get a lot of, um, you know, sometimes I write poetry. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I let myself sleep in or sleep longer. And I, a new practice that I have is allowing my body to wake up in its natural, like when it's ready to wake up right? and get up slowly instead of getting up and then copying right on the computer and then going to work for 50 hours that day. Right. That is so important. Um, creating like a ritual in the morning, I think, and being um, gentle with yourself as you get out of bed, because once the day starts getting away from you, it is very hard to reel it in. But you can kind of honor that practice, I think, in the morning, which yeah. feels really nice. And it's all softer, right? It's all, there's that masculine, feminine way of doing things. There's a little bit of, um, you know, with work and, and um, sort of being responsible and following up on your deadlines and you're very, you know, you get that right brain, left brain thing going and being able to be a little softer and gentler, even in whatever practice it is, um, helps balance. Cause I think that's important to have a little of each. Yeah. And I'm a super like driver, pusher, mover, yep. and I'm sure that you're the same given, mm -hmm. you know, your business. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm in the past year, I've really had to learn, how to say no, <laughs> right? What are boundaries and like what's okay for me? Mm -hmm. So you know, okay, I need to price myself. You know, for example, I need to price myself higher mm -hmm. because I put in so much effort into things. I need to make a boundary that if I'm doing a project that I have, you know, this many revisions or I'm going to do this amount of things and that, you know, like so right. it's really just like for me learning how to really figure out and do what works for me so that I feel good about the interactions that I'm in. Because for the longest time, I didn't feel like it was okay for me to have needs. Right. And that's a lot of, you know, it's just a symptom of poor self-esteem and a lot of people and a lot of women deal with that. Not being, not feeling like they can speak up for themselves or say no. Right. Or right. it's not being treated equally all the time. Men's world. Like if a man says they need something, that's okay. And if a woman asserts herself, it feels a little bitchy. And it's not right. It's a, it's, it's just not right. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me a little bit about, because I know you have this unbelievable crowdfunding campaign coming up and what that's going towards because um, Women Enough is really important. So let's talk about that a little bit. So, um, so I created Women Enough in 2010 after I was in a leadership development course and I realized that my the root cause of my you know, addiction disorders is that I didn't feel like I was good enough, thin enough, smart enough, whatever. And I wanted to um, create women enough to support all women in owning their worth far beyond their beauty and create media campaigns that support women in having a healthy body image and self-esteem. So I have been working with women in a very intimate um, 
women's circle for the past few years, bringing women together to talk about the things in our life that really shape our identity and shape our conversations and shape our relationships. And then these women come together in a women's circle. We, we bring up all these conversations and then these women pose naked. Mm -hmm. so the, the, um, the outcome of this experience and these photos is a media campaign called the Bear Campaign, which we launched this summer while I was um, in Bali. And, you know, and this is something that I had to really take on for myself because I did the website myself. I, you know, things are never perfect and I'm kind of a branding snob and, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, you know what, this is also, it's like another way that I could get in the way of me contributing in the way I want to and how so many women feel like you have to be, you have to look a certain way, you have to speak a certain way, you have to know a cer certain something or a certain someone in order to put their passion and their work in the world. And so I decided, you know, enough is enough of that too. This is another part of my own good enough, you know, belief and message. So we launched that campaign in the first week we had 200,000 visitors to our website. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was really, I mean, it was really cool. Mm -hmm. It was very validating. Um, and I honestly, I was, but the, but the thing I was like, well, where are these people coming from? Because mm -hmm. I didn't do any, you know, I didn't do any outreach or, or a media push. Mm -hmm. And then I just found out, they found it organically. I started posting photos on Facebook with the women's stories. Mm -hmm. So we curate their stories and there's a story along with each picture. And um, so I just, it got picked up organically. And then, you know, the campaign has been viewed over a million times. It's been in Cosmo and Shape and all over the place. Mm -hmm. And um, the pictures are beautiful. And if you don't mind, I'll, if you're okay with it, I'll put a few in this video. I'll edit them in so people can see when we put the link, yeah. how to find you, if that's, if that's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I've been bootstrapping this organization's vision for four years. Wow. And I have been gathering women for events. I've been community building for like TEDx women. I have been community building for women enough and really testing out my assumptions. Now I'm a very, I have got a very opinionated assumption. So I feel like I know I'm right when, you know, for many years I d talk to and deal with women that are dealing with the same things that I am. And it really is an epidemic. Yeah. Like body image mm -hmm. in the media is, it, it's, it's an epidemic. And Women Enough and the Bear Campaign exist to address that epidemic and to bridge the gap between perception and reality because we think that when we see a magazine, even if we know that it's Photoshopped, we actually think we're supposed to look like that. So when we <laughs> gather these women together and they share their stories, that's what helps women to have empathy, which helps them to not only have empathy on somebody else's situation, but themselves so they can stop comparing mm -hmm. and really start living into all of who they are beyond beautiful. Right. That is, that, you know what, it is so important. And when you catch, you know, you realize that uh, as girls, it's starting there and it's just sort of, that's the little secret that kind of carries through as they get to be women. And then they have to undo all those messages that they learned. Yeah. So let's like have them not learn those messages if there's any way to, you know. And, and one of the things um, with this campaign is to provide realistic role models of women right, or girls that mm -hmm. they also see what's behind the facade of a woman she might look good on the outside but you know you never know what she's dealing with on the inside which is uh, there still is like we are naturally competitive creatures mm -hmm. we've been bred to be competitive creatures and and you know fight for things and fight for jobs and in the workplace mm -hmm. and it's a really a new time where women are called to come together and to support each other in a, in a totally new way and um so our crowdfunding campaign is going to help us to expand our campaign in, and we'll actually have physical events mm -hmm. in four major cities in the United States. And with that campaign and with the photo shoot experience, the bear experience, we will follow up with a program that's called Ignition Circles, where women 
actually get to create really powerful relationships with other women and then co-lead, facilitate, you know, all of these take on what's really important to them beyond being beautiful. Right. So that's fantastic. So that's, and that's on Indiegogo, correct? Mm -hmm. Great. So we'll, I'll put that below. We'll have the link to that. Um, tell me this, this is a question I like to ask often is like knowing what you know now, what would you tell your younger self? Oh, um, well, I, I think about my younger self all the time and she's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, you know, I, I don't know. Okay. I actually think about this too. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you wish you knew, you knew then that you don't know now? That you know, or did I say that right? That you knew then, that you knew now, that you know. I focused my attention on, um, you know, so much of my life was about surviving, mm -hmm. and I would, I guess, like find the people and find the hobbies that I really enjoyed and stick with it. Right. To immerse myself in the things that I really enjoyed, and that was like being creative, mm -hmm. reading, like putting on, I put on little events for, for kids. Like just, I was very, I would have like family themed dinners, just little things that would nurture my own creativity. And instead I, you know, I, I turned off, I turned everything off. I stopped, I stopped being self-expressed. Right. And that's I just a symptom of so many, there's, that's an issue that so many girls deal with is like, okay, well, I'm supposed to be pretty. I'm supposed to be smart. I'm supposed to be either Sheryl Sandberg or Giselle or, right. You know, mm -hmm. where am I? Right. I'm, I'm a girl. I got a roll on my stomach. Um, not a size zero. Right. Where does that leave me? So it's to go after what, to go after what I love and to, you know, find people that would validate how, that I knew that there was more possible. Exactly. And validate that sooner. Yeah. You know, your environment, I tell my kids, is stronger than you are. So surround yourself. I sh as my daughter went off to college or I tell my son, you know, hang with the kids that are doing the stuff you want to do because invariably you have a common interest there. Right. And um, that makes it just that much easier. Yeah. And always trust that the universe has your back because they really do want the best for you. Yeah. So that's where it brings me to playtime. You know what that means. <laughs> so I've shuffled these cards and one of the things that I do is I will shuffle them again and I'm going to put them up to the um the camera okay and get to pick and then really when I show you the card what's the first thing that comes to mind and then I will tell you what comes to my mind too but I always kind of do this backwards right oh, I'm so excited I love this <laughs> these are angel cards it's all good for your highest and greatest good if okay. I'm pointing to you, how are you going to know it? So I'm going to, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, let me just, oh yeah, I got to come back and I got to go this way. Right. Okay. So now I'm going to start moving and you can tell go me. Back. Okay. Go back. Yeah. This? Nope. One more. Nope. What, one more this way? One more that, one more the other way. This oh, way. Sorry. Nope. The other way. <laughs> this way. This way, wait, That's I'm gonna go back. One. This one. one, yep. This one, yep. There we go. Okay. Actually here, it says romance. Ooh. Beautiful. That's a beautiful card. Mm. So what's the first thing that comes to mind when you see that? Oh, it's, to me it's, it's like the man, I mean, he's holding her and he's embracing her and, um, it's being held, mm -hmm. being, being safe, being cared for. Mm -hmm. I think when I saw that first, when it came out, and I, and I didn't see the word romance, but I did see, right, they were being held as um, it was coming out of the deck. And it did feel, it felt that way. And it felt like we're in this together. And the romance, whether it's, you know, the romance with yourself, with somebody else, with yeah all women, whatever it is, it's like we are in this together and we're, you know, together we're one. And can I add something real quick? Of course. 
So one of the things at the beginning of our admission circles program is talking about how we as women are really trained to make our relationships with men a priority mm -hmm. and to be self-sacrificing and to do anything to make it work. Mm -hmm. But we oftentimes don't have that same mindset in our relationships with women. So we don't invest as much. So we we're, you know, we're not as vulnerable. We have short-term thinking. Mm -hmm. We maybe we don't put ourselves on on the line like we could, or we don't prioritize that time enough. So the goal with ignition circles is to really give women the space to make their relationships to other women a priority. And That's a beautiful that we, thing. There's something that we don't get from men. And I like <laughs> I'm going to sound like a Southern person, which I, I never say this, but it just came out like, bless their hearts. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, oh, men, bless uh -huh. their hearts. Right. But for me, I feel like most of my emotional needs are met by my friends. Absolutely. I'm, yeah. Listen, I'm married 22 years, and I will tell you that, um, listen, this one marriage, so what does that say? But you are sometimes you don't feel like you're witnessed unless it's by another woman because they, they're understanding your emotional needs more than a man does. A man, if they're, you know, they're not all this way, but it is what it is. What you see is what you get versus a woman. It's all inside. And it's, and it's, this, it's a conversation. It's wanting to be heard. It's wanting to express ourselves. Especially I find that, you know, I'm not like in the technology space or doing this. So oh, the work that I'm doing is very personal and a, a lot of guys don't get it. Right. <laughs> or they'll say, really, do people even care about that? I'm like, I don't know. I think that's really what they care about. Right. That's yeah. feeling connected, feeling um, empowered. And, you know, I, I love that term global sisters. Like that's, you know, a, it's a beautiful thing. And that's what the internet and the technology allows us to do is connect. You know, you're on the opposite side of the country they're going to watch us in Australia, in Japan, in Israel. So it's great. Awesome. I love that. So I wanted to just say thank you so much. I'm going to have all your contact information, you know, on here. We're going to put this out to the social media gods and let it just rain money on your crowdfunding campaign. And I also would love to say that if any women are called to go bear and be part of this campaign, that there are specific ways that they can do that. In addition to physically going bare, like the concept of going bare is about bearing yourself vulnerably so that you have access to who you really want to be in the world and we're not, you know, pretending or hiding anymore. So women can also share their stories on our website. Oh, that's fantastic. I think I want to share my story on your website. Yeah. I love it. Love it. So thank you so Bye. much. And I'm so glad that we finally got to talk face to face and we will be doing more. And when you get to New York, we're still going out. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.